from the center of the universe and the home of your Grey Cup champion, Toronto Argonauts. It's the X's and Argos podcast. Welcome to the X's and Argos pregame walkthrough brought to you by Something in the Water Brewing. Ben Grant joined as always by JB as we get you set for Toronto's revenge game, the Argonauts taking on the Calgary Stampeders at BMO Field this Friday night at 7.30. I want to tell you a little bit about something in the water brewing before we get into the heart of our podcast. Something in the water is located in Liberty Village and they're thrilled with how the response has been so far in their sponsorship of the X's and Argos podcast. We've had so many of you listeners that have gone by for a drink, that have taken photos, put them on social media. It's amazing. We appreciate that, you supporting our sponsors. If you haven't been by yet, You've got to check it out. It's in Liberty Village. You can go before the game against Calgary on Friday. It's a great time to go. It's just steps from Lamport Stadium where the Argos practice and just steps from BMO Field uh, where the Argos play their their home games, obviously. And you can ask for some Longboat Pale Ale, the beer that is made for you, fans of the Double Blue. So check out Something in the Water Brewing. Uh, we got another big show is the Argos have to get into the stretch run. They have used up all three of their bye weeks and now it is stretch run time, 10 games in 10 weeks. Today we're going to be talking about the Three Down Nation midseason All-Stars that came out this week. We're going to talk about a wrestling event, AJ Olette, along with Dylan Giffen, uh, Red Knoll, uh, Dan Adebaboye at Greektown Wrestling. Plus we'll talk about what this game means, give you a practice report, go through the injuries, Go through OCDC, one thing, predictions, put me down for 20, and give you our CFL picks. All that more coming up on this episode of the X's and Argos podcast. All right, JB, let's get into things. First, the Three Down Nation midseason All-Stars. I love that Three Down Nation does this at the midway point of the season. I think it's a really nice sort of check to to look back and, and see what the team has accomplished to this point. The Argos at a little bit of a disadvantage statistically because at the midseason, you know, quote unquote midseason point, they've played fewer games than everybody else because of their early buys. And so I do think that factors in a little bit. But looking through this, I feel like the Argos are very well represented. You've got, I believe, eight Argos that made first team all-star and four Argos that are second team all-star. Uh, let's go through them one by one. So Chad Kelly, uh, as the as the quarterback, has he been the best quarterback in the CFL this season? Or is this just, you know, new kid on the block thing? And that's why Caleros isn't in here. I think he has. Claris has been steady, um, but I think that I was probably a little bit of new guy too as well. Um, but I think that uh, Chad has had some you know really fantastic games, and Claris has had a couple of stinkers, and that was probably enough to 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 tip the balance. You know, a bit of the new guy, a bit more consistent uh, with Claris being a clear number two. Yeah, I agree with that. I I think he's. I think Kelly hasn't, you know, his one loss is he played a quarter, right? That's the one Argos loss they have, and he was injured in that game. And I know Caleros um, had an injury as well, but he was losing in that game to Edmonton, not looking like he he had it going on in that game either. And I think that, in a way, is a little bit of a difference too. But uh, yeah, Kelly, very deserving there. Uh, on the O-line, Ryan Hunter gets the nod at guard. This one I found a little bit surprising because while I do like Ryan Hunter, and I think he's a very valuable piece to the Argos line, and I think uh, probably their best run blocker, I I was surprised to see him included on this list and not Dejon Allen, who made the second team all-star. I I have Allen as being the Argos' best offensive lineman. Hunter's not that far behind, but that stood out to me. Do you think that's just a lack of other guards really shining in the CFL? Or is this, you know, an NFL guy coming back to the CFL and so he's got some attention? Um, mm. Why aren't people noticing Allen? Yeah, it, well, I think Toronto's record helps. I think team, you know, I think that people who follow football know that if you have a good record, that it would be almost impossible to not have a good offensive line. So your eyes are going to be drawn to who is standing out on the offensive line that's allowing a team to to get to seven and one. So I think the record for sure draws the attention. Um, The fact that the Argos have been successful at running the ball and have been one of the top, you know, top couple of uh, running teams this season. Um, 
Chad has been able to play. He hasn't been chased all over the place. I think even even a casual observer can can recognize that the offensive line is doing a good job. So if if you look to him and um, if you look to PFF and and help have them kind of help quantify with some statistics, uh, I think it 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 makes sense that uh, that they're being recognized and I think speaks well to the whole process because a lot of times you get legacy offensive line. You know, you basically have some names that everybody knows and you just keep putting those names up. So I think the fact that the Argos are in the mix where they're not a traditionally powerhouse offensive line, like this is not an offensive line that, you know, was recognized last year for most of the season as particularly good. So it's great. It's great to see that that people are noticing uh, the talent. And I, I do give the three donation contributors credit. I, I guess I'm I, <laughs> I'm I'm one of those contributors, but I only have one vote. There's a bunch of us voting, uh, but I think they did a great job in not just going with, like you said, like not just going with the guys that were all all stars last year. You've got some new names on here, and so I do think this is an intelligent look at it. I just think Allen. I, I think he is. I think he's one of the still to this moment one of the best kept secrets in the league. And I think what hurts him is what hurts some of the other guys on the Argos too is that it's just such a good team as a whole that it sometimes it's harder to see sort of a shining star because there aren't it's not like there are big gaps elsewhere and so you just sort of watch an Argos game and say yeah that's a really good team you don't necessarily say oh this guy is carrying this team look how good this guy is this one player is a is a bright spot Um, I think it's harder to spot good play uh, when everyone is playing well. And so I think there probably are a few Argos that do get unnoticed, but it is nice to see the offensive line get some credit uh, with Hunter and and with Allen as second team for sure. Uh, moving along uh, onto the the Argos defense. Uh, actually, well, let's let's cover the second team offense players. You have AJ Olette, second team running back, DeVaris Daniels, second team receiver. Obviously that three touchdown game uh, last time out helps DeVaris's case. Uh, I, I wasn't surprised by that. I didn't think, I, I'm not really sure the Argos are the kind of team that is going to end up with a bunch of all-stars at receiver. AJ Olette, I understand why Brady Oliveira is ahead of him, but I think as games played start to even out, that may help him out a little bit too, because you look at his overall rushing numbers, and you're like, well, yeah, he's not, you know, he's a little bit, a little bit behind, but you start looking at uh, yards per carry, you start looking at efficiency and stuff like that. AJ Olette does stand out, and I would argue that his style of running, much like Oliveira's, is something that's going to stand the the test as as the weather starts to get more miserable as we get into the fall months. So I wouldn't be surprised to see AJ Olette make a push for first team by the end of the year. In terms of the defensive side of the ball, Dwayne Hendricks, uh, can you say something about how awesome he's been and how great it is to finally see him getting recognized as a as a first team All Star from uh, from Three Down Nation mid season? Yeah, I mean, I think it speaks to the, you know, I mean, I'm not a voter, so I, I guess I can compliment without it being too incestuous. Um, yeah, I think it speaks to the fact that the people who are contributing to this poll are watching football. And Hendricks is not a sack guy. Um, he's not a flashy guy. He he makes a lot of plays. Um, you know, any any football watcher will know, like a lot of times the play is made because somebody else made the play. You know, that whether you are the force and you are pushing the play back into the sack or you are shutting down the run or you are keeping the pocket and therefore allowing for an interception because the quarterback couldn't get out and run. A lot of those plays don't get recognized statistically, but when you watch the game, Hendricks is so dependable, um, such a really a technician. He just is really good at everything they need him to do. And he is a three down defensive lineman who has been unbelievable for the, for the Argos. Absolutely. And I think the the one area in which I feel like there was a bit of a miss here was not including Arimalade on the first team. Arimalade is a second team defensive lineman. There are so many good, there's so many good ends uh, in the CFL. So it is tough. But I just think he has been really unstoppable at times. I think, and, and the stat for me that does it, and this is a PFF thing, but 
it's pressures that for a Remolade, and you see that just watching the game, even stats aside, when we watch a Remolade play, he doesn't always collect sacks. He's usually one, uh, maybe two, but it's the pressures. It seems like every passing down, if a quarterback is going to take a three-step drop, not just sort of a catch and throw a quick screen, a Remolade is going to speed up that process. And to me, that is more valuable than the sack numbers because like you say, sacks often come from somewhere else. So I, I'm glad that he's second team, very deserving, but I do feel like he probably should have been first team on that defensive line. I'm imagining yeah, you'll agree having seen that same thing. Yeah, he has been, you know, he has taken over games uh, this season. I I can see it. I mean, I, I, I would say that he has had some amazing games and he's had some games where like just naturally you're not necessarily going to dominate. So I could I could see that argument that, you know, that potentially he hasn't dominated every single game this season. But certainly when he is on, um, he is uh, unstoppable as, as, you know, as unstoppable a pass rusher as there is. And I get why, like you look at the guys that, that did make the first team, you've got Matthew Betts from BC, who's had a billion sacks, and then Willie Jefferson, who's Willie Jefferson. So, you know, and, and he's yeah. still having as good a that's, season as any. Tough to, it, it's tough to crack, you know, it, and yeah. I mean, you know, really, he's been so close to, to you know, more pressures than sacks. So, you know, sometimes, you know, it's like the DBs have to deal with the guy gets the most interceptions, gets the award. Just It just unfortunately is... I think uh, it tilts that way. The Argos linebackers getting very well recognized. Both Winton McManus and Adarius Pickett make the first team. Uh, that's that's huge, and that's such a it's such a a core of stability within that Argos defense. The secondary is good. The defensive line is outstanding. But to be able to have that strength in the middle, the communicators that those guys are, and how well they play off each other, because I I think the numbers are there for Pickett McManus. The, the numbers in terms of tackles especially are there, but I think some of the stuff that they do best doesn't show up in the stats. I think the communication, I think the disguising of blitzes, those are things that both those guys are brilliant at. But yeah, I was really pleased to see them both get uh, recognized. And and that really does demonstrate how solid a positional group that is for the Toronto Argonauts. Yeah, and I, I don't think we should underplay what a big deal that is for Pickett. I mean, for him to come in um, and join the team and become that dominant, uh, you know, and potentially even be a nominee as, as I've certainly been banging the drum for, uh, for, you know, for defensive MVP. Um, that's an amazing accomplishment to come in at that position and, um, sort of plug and play at that level. DB's getting recognized too. Robertson Daniel, uh, who has so many, so many interceptions and highlight real plays. Royce Mechie, who has been lighting up the PFF board, both very deserving at their positions. I, I don't think, I don't think anyone would, would disagree with that. Anyone missed in the DBs? Like, again, it's tough to ask for more than two uh, from one single team in terms of first team all stars. Uh, but it, it's unfortunate because I, I think. I think Deshaun Amos has played really well. I think they've had really good play from Quantez Stiggers, although not the whole season. Remember, he didn't start. Uh, well, he, he actually did start week one, but uh, only because uh, Jamal Peters hadn't returned yet. Um, but when you've got a, a room with with Tavares McFadden, Jamal Peters, uh, and Quantez Stiggers there, he didn't start the season as sort of the regular go-to starter. Um, any, any any missed opportunities here for other guys in the Argos secondary? I, I I don't I think I think that th- certainly those guys have played fantastic and as a unit you know really especially at defensive back you're you're more a unit than anything else because you know if, if, if you know, parts only work because people are directed to other parts of the field because of great play and that's how you're able to make plays in the defensive backfield so it's really having anybody nominated in my opinion is a nod to the whole unit. So to have two, I think, is already a lot, you know, and 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 speaks to how well that group works as a unit, that you could have two separate people recognized, which means that all of the zone coverage, all of the rotations, all of that stuff is working because guys are in position to make plays. 
And there is no, that defense just doesn't have a positional group weakness, right? We talked about, we talked about those two D linemen. We didn't even mention, you know, we're not even, we're not even getting into Oakman and Brinkman and, and some of those other studs that they have on the D line. Yeah, we're not even no, getting into Jordan Williams and his play. Um, it's just such a strong defensive group. And then uh, lastly, Javon Leak recognized as the returner, which is such a nice thing. And you especially, because you, you've been <laughs> you've been asking for a return game from the Argos since we started doing this years ago. And finally, uh, finally, it's 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 arrived. Yeah. And Javon Leak is here. I mean, you know, what can I say? They lead the league in punt return average. Who, you know, who would have thought it? Um, Three touchdowns, too. Yeah. You know, Leak. Um, has elite second gear speed and the blocking has improved and uh you know he's 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 become a weapon that you know that the league certainly can't be happy about because it was something the Argos weren't particularly good at but the the field position for the Argos has been fantastic all season um it definitely has let them be more dominant this year than they were last year. I think if you look to why are they able to put up a, such a better record, I do think the improvement of that third team um, is what makes them elite and not just good. Can you sort of explain how the sort of confidence factor works in this? Because return, it's it's funny to me how having a returner who is succeeding seems to like breed success itself. Like it makes people better blockers. Like knowing when you've got a guy that you feel like has the threat to score on any given punt return or kick return, somehow that improves the quality of the blocking as well. Like how does that work? Um. Well, I mean, you know, I can hypothesize i think special teams is very scheme heavy um you know you 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 come up with your plan your blocking plan for left and for right and just like a defense the more and and to offense to some extent too the more when you have success then you um, then you buy in at a higher rate and when you buy in at a higher rate you are now performing your role with 100 percent attention instead of 75% because maybe you're cheating one way or the other because you're not sure what you're doing is correct. So I I do think it it kind of builds that way that the more you believe in a scheme, the faster you do it, the more aggressive you do it. You don't kind of um, leave, you know, hedge a little bit because you're not totally sure that the scheme is a great idea, which I think happens. So I, I do agree with you. I think the confidence in leak and the confidence in the scheme then builds upon itself in the same way that it can go the reverse. So right now those guys are 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 blocking like they haven't before with you know speed and aggression that because they know that Leak can take it and it can be a game changer. It, you 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 see it even at practice. You see it's a different energy um when they're running special teams. Let's get into Toronto Argonauts as wrestlers. There was a return to the ring for AJ Olette, and he brought with him some friends, uh, Dylan Giffen, Braden Noel, Dan Adababoye, uh, and Giffen, Giffen got into the action as well. Uh, let me just describe a little bit. I wasn't there. I didn't get to see the event. I, I wanted so much to see this, but I did have a conflict. Um, it sounds fantastic. I've, I've seen a bunch of video that has been shared on social media. You had AJ Olette, who had a, a previous encounter in the ring where he used his Argos helmet uh, to uh, spear somebody and then used his championship ring to uh, punch them into uh, the um, space. Uh, and this time out, he ends up uh, spearing somebody through a table, which was fantastic, and then executing the pin. And then Dylan Giffen uh, choke slamming somebody uh, underground because he is he is so he's, he's so tall, and he's just able to lift that that poor guy up like a hundred feet in the air and slam him into the basement. Uh, it was pretty fantastic to watch. Um, is this something like I, we don't see a lot of pro athletes doing stuff like this? Because I guess, you know, I guess teams worry about risk and, and things like that. I personally like seeing the Argos players engaging in pretty much anything. Where, where do you stand on having the Argos participate in Greek town wrestling and, and stuff like this? Yeah, I love it. 
I love it. I think I think that's the kind of stuff that 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 brings the team together. I think when the team, I think when any team hangs out socially, uh, that's a terrific sign of of the health of a team. That guys want to be around the other guys and not just kind of immediately get away from the field. So, the fact that you have a kind of mix of guys who are going out, um, you know, they're they're great athletes. Uh, you know, and I'm not I'm not worried about them getting hurt. They're they're elite athletes. I think they they deserve to to connect with the community. And uh, I'm sure I'm sure that the organization, you know, might have one eyebrow raised at it. But, uh, you know, if they're being properly prepared, you know, wrestling is is uh, not as dangerous as maybe uh, boxing or, or, or something along those lines. So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure there are some concerns, but uh, I think the the connecting with the community and the camaraderie within the team outweigh that. Yeah, I think so, too. And and they're not again, they're not doing like wrestling can be dangerous and can be full of risk if you are doing, you know, things like jumping off the top rope and, um, you know, uh, aerial maneuvers. And that's not what they're doing here. They're they're executing very simple things in which they're relying on the other guy uh, to sort of do the yeah, stunt work. Put them over, as they say in the biz. Yeah. OK, I don't I don't I don't know much about wrestling, but I do know that often the guy getting uh, hit or thrown or whatever is the guy that really needs to have the skill to it because that's that's sort of where you're selling it and and preventing injury and so you're sort of letting aj and and in this case Giffen just go you know go do your thing and we'll take care of the rest i love it i think it's great i think it uh, gets people talking about the argos i think i think it's a way of involving another sort of uh, another community too another you know the wrestling community especially like the indie wrestling community i think that's kind of cool that they're uh, that they're working together. And yeah, you can bet in the locker room uh, the guys are all talking about it. I'm sure they all have watched the video of AJ putting that guy through the table a thousand times and watch Giffen slam the guy into the ground. I, I guarantee they've all watched it and they're probably all really, really psyched for it. And it speaks to this locker room. I just saw a video, I think it was the CFL that just put out a video uh, Enoch Mwamba awarding AJ Olette with a T-shirt, and just even the you can see the 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 friendship and the camaraderie between those two guys, and just how they get each other. You see it in the Argos videos that they put out. Um, the social dynamics well, we see it at practice. You know the guys and guys that you don't necessarily even think like it's, it's so interesting that these guys seem to be uh, best buddies. Um, you know, just thinking like you know even today watching was it I think we were watching um, was Coxy Coxy and. Um, was it Stiggers that dancing together and and just having a good time? Guys that you don't necessarily see hanging out together that clearly have a positive relationship, I think is is pretty cool to watch. So yeah, I think this is all positive for the Argonauts. Uh, let's get into the practice report. Uh, over the last couple of days, a couple observations. Uh, I'll go first, then I'll turn some things over to you. First of all, this is a, this is a pretty healthy team, and you see that not just in the injury report, which we'll get to, but in the way, uh, the manner in which they're practicing, uh, the energy level that's there. They're they're fresh, and they should be. They've had three bye weeks already, and uh, we've got a long stretch coming, but. It would be the worst if in this situation they did not look this way, but they are full of energy. There's a, a lot of um, a, a, a real speed to the practice and a real enthusiasm that I'm really happy about. Uh, a couple of fun stories. Uh, watching Qantas Stiggers yesterday, just the athlete that he is. He and Royce Metzger are playing around a little bit. They were sort of doing a standing long jump against each other, um, doing some... Uh, sort of gymnastics too, and Stiggers pulled out this round off uh, back tuck, um, like full back flip, and it was not only perfect, he had room to spare. It was so easy the way that he just sort of threw down this back flip in the middle of practice, did it a few times, and no one else was going to try and do any gymnastics after that. No one was even going to try a cartwheel after that because uh, of how easy Stiggers made it look. And then his standing long jump, <laughs> he, he just like, he flew through the air. I, I took video of that one because it's just, it's fantastic. I'll have to share that another time. Um, but he's just such a sensational athlete. And to stand out in this group of elite athletes is something. I feel like every time we see this kid do anything, it kind of raises your eyebrows and we, we look at each other and like, you know, wow, that is that is an athlete. What did you see at practice that stood out to you? Um, looked like a very confident team. 
look like a team that uh, knows what it's doing, feels confident in what they're doing, you know, taking their time to work through things, but nothing was, you know, nothing was frantic. Coaches were coaching, but coaches seemed in a pretty good mood. Um, seemed a little more relaxed, kind of a rainy day today. Uh, the DBs uh, were showing off their ability to run routes and uh, letting the wide receivers know how to do it properly um, with uh, BD uh, that was showing off his arm. So that I think that suggests you know, it was not light, but you know, as a team, you, you can't you can't go at a hundred every single practice over the course of a season. So um, yeah, it, it, I, it, it, a team that can have a laugh is usually a team that's very confident and very um, very good in my experience. So yeah, it's, it's great to see that they're able to kind of work on things but also kind of uh you know take have a bit of had a bit of fun uh while they were doing it so it uh yeah it was it was it was really good to see and everybody seemed to be uh in a good mood which was uh which is nice to see on a rainy day we actually saw a lot of different drills and i credit the coaches there for just coming up with with new ideas and and new ways to keep guys engaged but yeah it, i don't think there's any positional group in football that is more confident in their abilities than dbs uh they they definitely felt like they were the better route runners than the receiver group which is kind of like watching them encouraging them you know uh, pretty yeah it was it was a real contrast between defensive and offensive players the the, the wide receivers were very sort of polite and cheering on their brothers and the dbs were openly chirping and yelling at them about <laughs> how much better they were so it, it was a nice distillation of how offensive players kind of go about their day and how defensive players do but i think overall for this week of practice this is exactly what you want the argos looking like at this stage of the season i, I don't think you could have a more more positive environment than what they've shown this week Let's get into that injury report. Uh, things look pretty good for the Argos. I want to go through uh, what's listed here. And I think the one area of concern, uh, and they've got this posted on CFL.ca, if you ever want to take a look at, at injury reports for, for either the, t the Argos or the team they're playing, they're, they're usually posted pretty promptly on CFL.ca. And so the Argos have down a, a couple of things. They have had... Um, no practices this week from punter John Haggerty. And I think that is, that's a little worrying for a couple of reasons. Now, the Argos also have the benefit of, they've got, they've got Boris Beatty who can punt and kick. Um, but it is an issue because John Haggerty's a holder. Uh, he's also a great punter. And Beatty has been kicking field goals really well this year. And so you don't really want to disrupt that. Haggerty's also a global player. And so if he can't go, and he's listed right now as questionable for Friday's game, if he can't go, it's it's going to disrupt some things. Are are you more, like when you see John Haggerty on this list, are you more, to, more worried about him as a holder? Are you more worried about him as a punter? Like where are you worried if he can't go that the Argos will miss out? No, I I think it's fine. I think that uh, where they are, they are why, in my opinion, you'd be wise to shut it down till he is one hundred and ten percent ready to go. Um, they they do have some depth. I mean, they BD can uh, can punt, and they can certainly do that for a game. Uh, if they want to bring in their international kicker um, to to give BD a break, so he's not doing both. You know, I, I think they're built for this. I don't I don't think they need to do anything. Um, drastic or frantic. I think you let Haggerty recover 100%, and and they have the depth at that position to, to either go straight BD or uh, or to kind of do a combo. And I wonder if you could even like suppose. Uh, so he's listed as a knee injury. He didn't practice all week. There's probably no reason why he couldn't hold and not punt. So if you really wanted to, if you didn't feel like I, and I think you and I both feel pretty good about good shoes as as a kicker. But if you really wanted to go that way, you could just have Haggerty as the holder and keep him dressed as a holder and have BD punt and kick because he's done both in the past. So I think they do have that flexibility. 
Um, but if Hegarty can't go, I think in, in terms of in terms of dressing another global player, probably could choose is the easiest way to go. So we'll have to see how that one works itself out. But that was that's interesting anyway. The other one that stands out is David Unger the third, who's been listed as limited all three practices this week, and he's listed as questionable right now. Um, and Unger the third has been playing really well this year. He's had a couple of of huge breakout games. He's really been a bright spot. I think. The fact that Demonte Coxey has been full at least allows you uh, a little bit of flexibility there. They have some room now. Uh, if if Coxey were still banged up, then I'd be more worried about this. But I feel like if you've got to sit Unger for for a game or even two games, I feel like the Argos are okay. You know, with with Tommy Neal coming back to health and with with Brissett there too. So I'm a little less worried about Unger. But yeah, both those guys listed as questionable. Uh, and then Dylan Giffen has is, is already been listed as out. Robert Priester has been listed as out. Everyone else that was on the injury report, uh, Coxie, Barlow, McFadden, Tate, are all listed as, as good to go. So um, I think the Argos are in a pretty good spot going to this game injury-wise. For the Calgary Stampeders, there's a couple that stand out. So Bryce Bell, left tackle. Uh, he has already been listed as out for this game. He didn't practice at all this week. He's out. Kadeem Carey, actually, we'll talk about Bryce Bell for a second. Calgary's O-line does not have the depth that it did last year. And I just don't, and I don't think they've been playing nearly as well as they did last year. They were a great unit last year. With Bell out, I do think that puts some stress on the O-line, an O-line that has already been under pressure. And going against Toronto's D-line, one of the best in the CFL, I do think that's an issue. So we'll see what their solution is, how they go about solving that problem. But if I were Coach Mace, I'd be scheming to try and take advantage of, of the blind side uh, against Jake Mayer. Uh, Kadeem Carey has been listed as out. That's not as big a deal. I do think Kadeem Carey is one of, is one of if not the best running back in the CFL. I don't think the drop-off is huge to Mills, though. I really like him. So I I don't think that's as big a deal. Uh, Other guys on the list, uh, Jonathan Moxie is questionable, but he practiced full for three straight days. I expect him to go. I don't think that's going to be an issue. And, you know, other than that, no one really stands out on this list to me. So I think it's a fairly healthy Stampeders team. I just think, I think they've, they've got to... They've got to find an answer for Bryce Bell, and I think the Argos have to find a way to take advantage of that. Game preview, JB. Uh, This one means more to the Stampeders, but the Alouettes have been hanging around. How big is this game for the Argos? Um, I think it's big. Um, All right. Maybe big's too strong. I think think it is big. Uh, as I've talked before, that you need to win the games you play after your bye, especially at home. Uh, the next six weeks are uh, going to be uh, a lot for the Argos. And, you know, Montreal is right there and pushing. So I think that it, it is big in that you definitely you definitely want to win your home games. You definitely want to win after a bye. Um, I think that Calgary is... You know they're they're a little Jekyll and Hyde-ish, but that's a team that you should be able to take care of uh, in terms of you know them being fourth in the West. Uh, I think you know I think this is a game that Toronto should win. So it, it's big in that way, I guess that this is a team they should that de- they should definitely beat. Yeah, I, I think I, I've talked about this really for the last few weeks, I guess, that I feel like these wins now are what you're doing so that you can rest later in the year. Um, and, you know, I talked about that a little bit earlier today, too. Like the the idea of being able to rest guys those last couple of weeks of the season is huge, but you earn that by winning these late summer games. And so if they can stretch that lead, Montreal's been hanging around, but they're not going to be able to stay with you forever. If you keep winning, at some point, Montreal is going to fall off. They've got a, a stretch of tough games starting with with um, going into Winnipeg this week. So if the, the Argos can keep winning, they will start to create separation. It's already there with the other two teams in the East. So uh, for me, it's, it's a big game that way. You're winning now to buy rest later. All right, JB, it is time for OCDC. <laughs> OCDC is brought to you by the Business Barbershop and Spa. They invite you to check out Etobicoke's premier licensed men's grooming lounge for hair, face, and body care, celebrating 10 years in the Kingsway. And if you want to check out the Business Barbershop and Spa, 
my last haircut last week was a videoed and you can you can watch the highlights of my haircut and my experience at the business barbershop and spa it's awesome i love going there lindsay took care of me last week gave me a great haircut and yeah i just i love that i feel relaxed when i leave that place to me that's almost the best part of the experience is the fact that you can just kind of turn everything off uh, while you're there, just in, enjoy the facility, enjoy what they've got there and uh, and get a great haircut to boot. So check out the Business Barbershop and Spa. You can watch that video on our YouTube channel uh, if you want to see what it's like and why <laughs> did, you should be down it, there. It did convince me I, I am getting my haircut there next time. It's it's awesome. Like it's it is an awesome place. I know you've never been, and that's something that um, I, I would. Uh, I don't know if we'll we'll document your haircut the same way that we did mine, but uh, yeah, it's it's a great place to go get a haircut, and uh, and hopefully you can check it out in the Kingsway. All right, JB, let me get into this uh, Calgary O as we tee up O and D for Calgary. Uh, it's it's hard. Calgary is not a good football team, but somehow they put together great games against the Argos year after year they they do it um Argos lost a tough one uh, in Toronto last year they got blown out both times in Calgary the last two games I think Calgary's offensive plan I think you probably try and run at Arimalade I, I think you know that the Argos are going to be without Brinkman this week he's on the sixth game I think Arimalade is so dangerous when he's chasing, uh, when he uses his speed. I think you've got Mills, a really good downhill runner. I think you load up. I think you go heavy and you try and target Arimalade and try and force the Argos to keep him off the field, which is going to help you in passing down. See if they, you can get the Argos to rotate guys. He's Arimalade, you know, he's fine against the run, but he's far better against the pass. And so if you can establish a ground game that targets him, that forces Toronto to take him out, then I think you're going to you're going to get somewhere and that's going to allow you to do other things. And I think off that same action, you can boot Mayer, you can roll him out a little bit. I think you've got to take the short passes. It's what Mayer's most comfortable with. I, I don't feel like there's a lot of trust in letting him go downfield. And I don't think the Argos are the team to do that against. So you take those short routes, build those long eight, nine, ten play drives that result in scores. And I think you reintroduced the screen game. For some reason, Ottawa didn't run. I don't think they ran a single screen against Toronto last week. And it's what teams have been killing them with. Go back to that. And I think the I think the Stampeders are a good screen team. So that's something that I would bring back in to support that uh, that heavy run game that that they're going to be showcasing against Toronto. So that's my offensive plan for Calgary. If you are the Stampeders' defense, uh, what is your plan, JB, to stop Toronto? Yeah, I mean that that is really the question that that the league has asked is how do we slow this team down? Um I think that you're you're if you're Calgary, you have a pretty good defensive line and linebacker crew. Um that's that's the strength of your defense. Uh I think that at the point you're at where you are dangerously close into, you know, when you can see the elks in your rearview mirror, you are driving down the wrong road. So they are dangerously close to losing this season. So to me, this is a kitchen sink game. I would, I would blitz the heck out of Toronto. I would send heat um, as much as possible, more than other teams have. I think you just have to risk it. I don't think you can just play conservative football against Toronto. You are on the road. You need a win to to stay relevant in the west and i i don't think you can just match up and play ball with toronto they're they're a better team so you know awe and judge um i would i would bring uh as as much as i could um let that defensive line uh eat in terms of you know twists and delayed blitzes and um run blitzing you know um in uh, an early downs not letting olet get free releases on pass plays. So I'm looking to take away the run, um, which you can when you bring heavy blitzes and I'm, I'm chasing Chad Kelly, you know, and if he's able to beat it, so be it. But I, I wouldn't, if I'm Calgary, I don't want to lose this game. Like, you know, 17, 15. Um, I think you, you want to either try and steal this game or you, or you get blown out because who cares if you get blown out? I would, I would swing for the fences if I'm, if I'm Calgary here. Switching over to the good guys, uh, offensive plan for Toronto this week. I went back to that Calgary game to break down what Calgary was trying to do 
against uh, what Calgary's D was trying to do against Toronto last game, because I think we'll probably see a lot of that. Remember, Chad Kelly only played 11 offensive snaps when Toronto played Calgary. And so Calgary didn't really have to show too much of their hand. I think you're probably going to get the Calgary defensive game plan that they started to show and then they changed it up. Once Kelly was hurt, they they changed up a lot. I don't think we saw the full plan. I think we're going to get the rest of that. And a lot of that is like what you describe. And so when I'm coming up with my offensive strategy for this week, I'm trying to counter what Calgary showed very briefly in those 11 snaps. So first of all, they did blitz a lot. In those 11 snaps, they had six blitzes. And on two of the plays where they didn't blitz, it's because the Argos were backed up in second and 15 and second and 13 situations. So really a normal down and distance heat was coming behind it it was a range of coverage but there was one similarity so they they ran cover zero twice they ran cover one once had a couple cover threes in there they even spied a little bit which uh, was more as a way of tracking kelly as opposed to preventing him from running it was more preventing him from from having time if he were to roll out so we did see a lot of stuff there but what those coverages had in common is that they were all playing pretty close to the line of scrimmage. They were not backing way the heck up and giving those underneath windows in zones, which Kelly has picked apart against other teams. So if that's the plan, the way to counter that this week, I don't think it's running into what they're doing well. I don't think you actually want to run a ton this week. I, you have to, to some degree. Obviously, it's a good part of your offense. You can't have Chad just drop back every time. But I don't think running can be the focal point because Calgary is going to take that away and they are going to send heat. I think you try and go over the top. Remember, Toronto's one touchdown with Kelly in there was on a bust. It was on a deep pass to to Cam Phillips, I think it was, who had slipped in behind coverage. I think that's where you're going to generate points this week, going deep. Uh, and they did have some success downfield, even a couple of plays that were called back uh, due to penalty. That's probably where I'll go again. So I want to see go routes. I want to see deep posts, deep corners, catch them in their cover zeros, catch them, catch them in cover threes where they aren't able to get the depth. They're playing cover three sometimes where the corner's pressing and he's still got deep third responsibility. Burn them with that. And so if that's the style they're going to play, make them pay. Go deep. I want to see a lot of deep balls. I would like to see the pocket moved a little bit just to buy Kelly some time to let those deeper reds develop. But I think that's probably where this game is won for Toronto this week on connecting with with Daniels, with Gittins Jr., with, with Coxie if he's able to go. Uh, downfield. Uh, so that's that's my plan. What's your Argos defensive plan? Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult to come up with one specific because Calgary is sort of very kind of mediocre across the board. They they run okay. Um, Mayer has a lot of passing yards, but he doesn't throw a lot of touchdowns. Um, you, you know, their special teams are are fine, but not 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 elite. Um, so I, I'm not sure how exotic you need to be to to play Calgary. I think that you you probably want to load up against a run early and kind of dissuade the uh, the offensive coordinator from handing off. Um, but, but Meyer, you know, is is likely to give you a ball. He does turn the ball over. So I I do think you 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 want to mix in. You know, I mean, it sounds kind of boring to kind of have this sort of run-of-the-mill defensive plan, but I, I think that's what you have against a run-of-the-mill team. I think you load up against a run early. I think you you mix in a blitz and blitzing downs. Um, you you definitely want to take away that, that short game from Meyer so he doesn't get his confidence early and kind of bait him into deep passes because he will turn that ball over. Um, yeah, I, I don't think they need to do anything terribly exotic to beat Calgary um uh you know defensively I mean Calgary just is not that good an offensive team so I think that you 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 have confidence in your team and confidence in your in your base sets and you just go out there and and, and play ball you don't have to take many risks I think you're you're looking to to try and get ahead early and have try and Calgary catch you and that's the game for sure it's, it's you don't want to get into a rock fight with Calgary if you can you know, it's not the defense, but if you can score early, uh, I think then you're really kind of setting yourself up for for a good game. But uh, you know, I, I think you're just playing ball. I think you're you're just mixing it up in a in a kind of very sort of normal way, and and 
just being the better team should be enough to overcome it without having to get too too specific or too player orientated because I don't think Calgary has anybody worthy of a of a game plan. Yeah, I agree. I think Toronto gets out there, just do what you do best, and it, that you know that that should work out in Toronto's favor. So yeah, I like that plan. It's time for one thing. So my one thing this week, I, and I think. You know, going back the the last few years, I I haven't hit on a one thing with any kind of regularity this year. <laughs> uh, not that that's new for us. Like we typically swing and miss at, at one things, but I've had trouble. I'm gonna I'm gonna dumb it down a little bit this week, make it a little easier to attain because I, I I think I need a hit on a one thing. Uh, so my one thing is going to be I want two first half touchdowns because I think if Toronto can score two touchdowns in the first half. I think this game is over. I don't think Calgary has the firepower to be able to hang with Toronto if they're putting up 28 points by the end of the game. And I think if you can put up 14 in the first half or 17, something like that, 17, 20 obviously would would, would be more than enough in my view in that first half. But two touchdowns in that first half, I think Calgary is going to be scoring a lot of their points via field goal. And I think that just about puts it away. So it doesn't have to be your, it doesn't have to be putting up uh, you know, ridiculous numbers or anything like that. I don't think one touchdown a quarter is too much to ask. But for me, if Toronto can do that in the first half, it's going to force Calgary to do things they don't want to do in the second half. And that's where the floodgates are going to open. So two touchdowns in the first half. That's my one thing. JB, where are you going for one thing? Um, I'd love to see them keep Calgary to one sack or, or none. I think Calgary is a very good uh, pass rushing team. I think Calgary is going to lean on that. I think it's going to be maybe the biggest test this year of the offensive line. And I'd like to see them. I'll give them one, but let's, let's one sack or less. Yeah. Like Rose was a problem last game and he's been a problem in a lot of games. Like if you can, if you can keep Mike Rose at bay, I think the yeah. rest I mean, of the team is okay. Like, uh, you know, Hauser's fine, but he's not like a, a sack monster that we've seen. And, and, you know, more, I, I don't, you know, again, fine. Awe, Judge, they're great players. Rose is the one that scares me though. Like the, the guy that's tough to control. And so I feel like if you can keep him from getting to Kelly, the, the O-line has been really good at keeping sacks down and Kelly's been good at it too. So I just think Rose is the one sort of X factor when it comes to sacks. It's the one aspect of their team that is elite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. And, and he himself is, is, is a monster. So yeah, if they can, if they can keep sacks um, to a minimum, what, what did you say? One, one or none? Yeah. One, one or less. Yeah. I think that's, you know, if they come out of this game, one or fewer sacks, I think it means Toronto's yeah, won they, that game. If they win the game, I, I would guarantee that. It is time for our predictions. Uh, this to me is a Toronto win. I know that's not very exciting to predict for a 7-1 team. I do think it's going to be a little tighter just because Calgary's weird. They have trouble with Calgary. I don't, I guess I know a little bit why. Like they've got a lot of pieces from Calgary and vice versa. I think this is 26-20 Toronto. I think they pull out a little bit. Calgary makes a bit of a late comeback. Toronto hangs on to win. So 26-20 is where I'm going. Uh, how does this one end for you, JB? Yeah, I, I do fear it is going to be a rock fight. Um, just because I think Calgary is going to be not very happy about last week. And I think they're very confident about their ability to beat the Argos. I think they definitely feel like they can win. Uh, I have it 24-21 uh, Argos. It's time for Put Me Down for 20. And before we get into Put Me Down for 20, I just want to remind you that while gambling can be a fun way to enhance your sports viewing experience, it's important to do so responsibly. Set a budget, never bet more than you're happy to lose, an amount that you'd view as the cost of entertainment. And if you or anyone you know is developing a problem with gambling, you can call the Ontario Problem Gambling Helpline 1-888-230-3505. So JB, uh, we are we're in sort of different ends when it comes to uh, put me down for twenty. We started yeah. with two hundred golden fleeces. Uh, I'm sitting pretty at three fifteen at the moment. Um, you need to hit here uh, at eighty four golden fleeces. So we will start with you. Where are you putting your twenty golden fleeces for this week? Uh, yeah, I, I have not. I have not had a lot of success there. Um, I'm going to go. Uh, in terms of the Argos, I'm going to go 10 on uh, AJ Olet being the first uh, first uh, player to score a touchdown. 
I like uh, I like that. I I feel that the Argos have done really well in the red zone, and um, I feel like that that's going to be, um, you know, I think that's going to be how they get there. I think they get there and uh, um, bang it in. So I've got Olette with the first touchdown. Uh, my other one is I'm going to put ten. God help me. Um, I'm betting on the Elks. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to bet on the Elks to to win their game at at home. Um, I'm going to have them cover their spread, but I I'm going to have them uh, have the under. So Elks to cover and the under, uh, the under being 45 and a half. So I think that's going to be another kind of rock fight game. But I, I think the Elks feel good. I think I think that uh, you know having Ottawa come in is as good a chance as any. They have to have this game circled in terms of games they can win at home um you know they they don't necessarily have a lot of chances so i i think they're going to look at this as as a real chance to to end that narrative uh that everybody talks about every week so i and i i see the number 46 and a half for the over under so i'll give you that which is a point better and that's at plus 260 and aj first touchdown force plus 470 which is a really nice number too so yeah hopefully you can hit on these and and get back into uh into (laughs) some positive space Mm -hmm. um for my golden fleeces i'm gonna put 10 golden fleeces for the argos game i'm gonna put um aj olette under 77 and a half yards and my rationale for that is i just don't see that as being the the correct game plan this week so i just don't think this is a game where they're going to feature Ola as heavily as they have in weeks past because uh, that's what Calgary's trying to take away. We saw that last time these two teams played. They were run blitzing. I think Ola only had like 37 yards rushing or something like that the last time these two teams played. And so Toronto decided instead of just, you know, pounding into into a brick wall, well, let's let's throw it instead. And they found other ways to generate that same sort of attack off um without using the run game. So maybe you see Olette involved more in screens, et cetera. Maybe they just pass more downfield. But I think that number, 77 and a half, is, is pretty high for an over-under number on a running back in the CFL, even with AJ's outstanding numbers he's had. I, I just don't feel like Calgary is going to be the team to, to stack up yardage against that way. My other 10 golden fleeces, uh, I got a parlay going here. Uh, BC minus 10 and a half. I hate that number, but I just think BC might blow the doors off Hamilton this week. And I'm going to parlay that with Ottawa winning on the money line. And that combines to be plus 281. So that's my that's my 20 golden fleeces for this week. All right, let's get to our CFL picks. And JB, you are doing a lot better in CFL picks, fortunately. Uh, 27-16 is your record at the moment. Uh, you are coming off a tough week, though. One and three last week. Uh, it was a bit of a weird week in the CFL. Uh, so let's go through where we are going this week. We got Montreal at Winnipeg. I'm going Winnipeg. you got to be going Winnipeg on this one, too, right? I do. Uh, uh, Montreal is much better at home than they are on the road. I still think you are you can't you can't take uh, a visitor to Winnipeg it would be pretty tough too. Calgary, Toronto. We both got Toronto on that already. Uh, Hamilton, BC. I already said I think BC is going to blow the doors off Hamilton. Uh, are you going to roll the dice and pick the <laughs> Tiger Cats? No, BC is really good at home. Yeah, no, they're and they're just in different tiers right now. Hamilton coming off a loss to Edmonton, just they they had nothing last week. It just didn't look like a football team ready to play off a bye week at that. So. Traveling to BC should not help no, things. I like, as they say, I like BC big. Ottawa at Edmonton. This is going to be a game. I'm excited about watching this one. Ottawa Edmonton could go either way. We have these are both of your nemeses. Uh, I and, do. I know. I hate them. Uh, I I'm going Ottawa. I do think. I think Edmonton coming off their win. I think there's a little bit of a pressure off. I I don't really feel, despite what what Ford was saying this week about playoffs and stuff like that. I just don't. I don't think the team really believes that this year that that they're in playoff contention with one win at this stage of the season. I think that still monkey on their back at home is still hanging there. So I've got Ottawa. I don't. I don't. I don't have a lot of faith in Ottawa, but I do feel like they're going to win this game this week. And I guess you've got Edmonton because you picked them covering the spread. So maybe that's the one game where we're different this week. Yeah, I just I just think if 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 Edmonton looks at the games they have left at home, um, you know, they play the West and then they get Montreal a little later in the season. But I think if you look at it, you're like, if not now, when? 
you know, that Montreal game, Montreal is probably going to be fighting for something there. Um, I, I think you just have to circle this Ottawa game as your Super Bowl. And, you know, this is the weakest team that is coming here before the end of the season. So we have got to get this done. Come and join us. BMO Field, Friday night, 730. This is a great one for a few reasons. One, your Argos ticket gets you into the CNE because the CNE is going on, but you can spend all day, right? Get get in the, the gates with your with your Argos ticket, spend the day, take some rides in, visit the food building. I'm excited to do that too. And then come and join us uh, at BMO Field for the game. It should be a great game. It's a great atmosphere. They've actually opened up tickets in the uh, the end zone, sort of where the, the shipyard is or was. Um, so you've got fans that are going to be in both end zones for this game, which they haven't done before. And that tells you sort of where we are in terms of, of ticket sales. I think it's going to be a really nice crowd. Um, when I looked the other day, it looked like the uh, west side was almost all sold out. The east side is selling really well. And um, the south end zone, I believe, was sold out too. And so those north end zone tickets going fast as well. It should be it should be a great crowd. It should be a great atmosphere. It's an even better value than it usually is. And it's already a great value because you get to go see the c e as well. So hopefully we'll see you down there Friday night. And, you know, maybe you, maybe you drop by something in the water on the way there too. That will just about do it for us on this episode of the X's and Argos podcast. For JB, this is Ben Grant saying so long and may all your pre-snap reads be good ones. I'll see ya. Go Toronto Argos, go, go, go. Pull together, fight the fight.